Okay, I think there are enough people in, so I'll go ahead and start. So, hello everyone. Uh, thanks to Izzy. Um, my name is Andrew Sagona. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my, for some reason, my ring finger doesn't work properly, so I have to bend it over to make W's or M's for that matter. Um, so thank you everyone for coming out today. I'm a little bit overwhelmed with such a large room, so bear with me. Um, so anyway, my name is Andrew Sagona. I'm a graduate of UCF. I'm a local boy. Uh, with degrees in journalism and political science, and I also graduated from the FIU College of Law, so their law school, back in 2017. I'm not a lawyer yet, I just want to get that disclaimer out there. So, I will be soon, I'm taking the bar, uh, so hopefully this time next year I'll have an Esquire on the back of my name instead of just JD. Um, so, Part of that disclaimer is I am not allowed to give legal advice. And the long story short of that is I can't give you advice on any particular cases. Uh, so here I'm just kind of giving general advice, uh, general information, things like that. But uh, in the pamphlet, and I'll, do, and I'll read it out at the end, um, you, you'll see my email. It's andrewsagona.advocate at gmail.com. Um, and just email there if you have any questions and I can direct you to someone who will be able to help you. A little more about me and then we'll get started. I am a self-advocate. I have epilepsy, Asperger's or autism, however you want to describe it, um, and a few other miscellaneous disabilities. I graduated from the Florida Developmental Disabilities Council's Partners and Policymaking Program and I have two sis older sisters who also have disabilities. So, I mean, luckily for me, I haven't been, I haven't been in too many encounters with the police before, but I have experienced discrimination in pretty much everything I've done, as I'm sure a lot of you have as well. Um, and because of this and more, my goal, once I do become an attorney, is to become a civil rights disabilities attorney. And then one little last thing is this presentation is actually based on a paper that I wrote in law school. We had to take a, what they call a seminar course, and one of the requirements is you had to write a 30-page paper about a topic. And this is the one that I chose because it's right up my alley and it's something I'm very passionate in. So just as a primer, People with disabilities make up the largest minority in the entire country, with 22.5% of the population, which is about 72 million people. And then they also make up the second largest minority in Florida at 23.5% and at 4.7 million people. Actually, you know what? Sorry, I'm two more things. Um, one, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this, but today is the fifth anniversary of the Pulse shooting. Um, that one affected me very close, a lot of my friends very close, and uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, there's a remembrance going on uh, near where it happened downtown, so if you have free time, go over there and check it out. And then secondly, on a more related topic, uh, if anyone here is comfortable discussing, uh, what brings you here today? Uh, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll point you out. Yes, ma'am.
Gotcha. And then SAMHSA is S-A-M-H-A, correct? Okay. S-A-M-H-S-A. Oh, SAMHSA, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Um, anyone else want to? Yes, in the back, and then I'll come to you. Um, the man on the right, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you went to that, even though it's a little bit uh, limited. I'm good friends with the Dietzes, um, and I've, I've worked with them in the past, so they're, they're a huge uh, repository of information. Um, and then ma'am to his left, or his right. Absolutely. Anyone else want to discuss, or I'll just go ahead and get started? Okay. Um, oh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm here to point out what um, is meant by um, how you say how, when it says that a lot more people with disabilities are more prosecuted, are wrongly prosecuted, and so I'm trying to find out more on the details of what you mean by saying that more people are wrongly prosecuted and more people with disabilities are wrongly Um, and I'll get to that in about the three quarters way. Um, sorry, I'm kind of going back and forth. I'm coming up with more housekeeping ideas as I go on. Um, just make sure I get through the information. If you can hold your questions till the end and uh, I'm more than willing to take questions well after the presentation. So um, just to make sure I can get through this. Okay. So, as I mentioned, 22.5% of the population has a disability in the US, 23 and a half in Florida. But the percentage of people that interact, are arrested in, by law enforcement, go to jail, is significantly higher than that. It's, it's magnitudes higher. And these interactions, these encounters, if you will, um, will result in, in arrests, injuries, death. And it's a problem that affects people of all kinds of disabilities, from autism to physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities, mental disabilities, as a lot of them refer to, especially people with mental disabilities. So one reason for the rise in these encounters is because the closing of institutions. That, I'm not sure if anyone knows really of Willowbrook, Pennhurst, uh, here in Florida, Sunland, in Tulsa you had Hissom. These institutions for people, it was designed to help people who had mental, intellectual disabilities, but it, it became so much worse than that. And as a result, they were closed. But the downside is people that had been residing in these, or residing, quote unquote, are now in public in the streets and it was a wave of them. So many and it kind of overwhelmed the existing framework of how to interact and help these people. However, people with disabilities are, as I mentioned, they're at a rate well above the percentage of the population they're interacted versus how many of them are in the population. Encounters with law enforcement serve as the entry point for individuals with disabilities. And it's outside of typical interactions such as you have a broken taillight or you ran a stop sign, things like that. 
And these encounters, the reasons for them vary widely, but you can kind of narrow it down into three areas. You have those that are brought by the community at large. You have those that are brought by the person's family. And then you have those that happen in schools. Um, for example, and I quote, these people may be involved in minor infractions for uh, or behaving in atypical ways, such as standing in front of a store or walking in traffic on a busy street and talking to themselves. Um, a couple of instances I can think of is a boy sitting at the front of the store, uh, talking to himself, waiting for his mother to pick him up. Um, as a person, he had autism, so he would kind of rock in place. That's, as I mentioned, atypical. So someone might call in thinking, oh, they're on drugs or something. And then more related to Florida, if anyone's heard of the Arnaldo Rios case uh, that happened about five years ago, he was a man with autism who was sitting in the middle of a street holding a toy truck. And someone called the police on him because they thought he was holding a gun as they were driving by. It was a, it was a silver, shiny, uh, truck. His caregiver came out in the middle of the street to calm him down, try to bring him back to his group home. And unfortunately, when police arrived, uh, despite the caregiver saying everything's fine, it's a toy truck, it's not a gun, uh, the police still shot at Arnaldo, unfortunately hit the caretaker. Thankfully, he, was he lived, um, but still... Uh, that's kind of an example of the community calling in. Then family, uh, family members, if it's someone who's particularly strong and who has a tantrum, a tantrum and is acting out physically and overpowers the family, you might need some assistance to try and calm them down, make sure they don't hurt anybody. And unfortunately, sometimes families will call the police and unfortunately, the police is woefully inequipped to help these people, and sometimes it results in a death. And then schools, this one's unbelievable. There are little five-year-old children who are being handcuffed and sent to jail because they threw blocks at their teacher, which, believe it or not, throwing a block or hitting a teacher is considered a felony in Florida. Um, children with disabilities are being arrested at higher rates and at younger ages than their peers who do not have disabilities. 12% of students nationwide have some form of disability. 25% of students that are arrested have a disability. In Florida, it's even worse. 13% of students in public schools have a disability. 29% of arrested students have a disability. Uh, just to shout out Pinellas County, I'm not sure if anyone here is from Pinellas. Um, students with disabilities are three times more likely to be arrested than students without disabilities. There's a school here in Orlando called Cherokee County, or sorry, Cherokee School, where one in five students have been arrested. And as, as I alluded to, some of the arrests are ridiculous. Uh, Janae Jelks, who's this 12-year-old at the time at Cherokee School, she'd been arrested and charged with three felonies, poking a police officer, throwing plastic blocks at her teacher's face, and hitting her principal. And another student at that same school was arrested for punching a staff member. And the student said, I'm sorry for hitting you. Please don't send me to jail. The student had been quote, held overnight several times after arrest at school, and the older, boy, older boys in his cell block encouraged him to say his prayers before going to sleep. That's not what jail is for, these little, these little kids having a little bit of a temper tantrum. Going to adults now, even though ADA regulations apply to arrests, people with disabilities are often not accommodated. Um, for instance, someone who uses sign language. If you put your hands behind their back and in handcuffs, you can't talk, basically. They can't talk. Um, and that, that happens quite a bit. 
Um, another interesting statistic. The Washington Post found that one quarter of people killed by police officers in 2015 had mental health conditions. And I believe that number has gone up to 33% at latest, uh, latest count. It's, as I mentioned, 22.5% of the population has a disability. 33% is killed by police in various ways, whether it's uh, a man with Down syndrome in, I believe, Arizona, who was in a movie theater watching a film. The police held him down and blocked his airway, so he unfortunately suffocated and passed away. Or you have the case of Freddie Gray, Eric Garner. Uh, I'll come to you at the end of the session. If I remember correctly, he movie hopped, as they call it. So he bought a ticket to one movie, went into another theater to see another movie without having paid for a ticket. So the management called the police on him. And then you also have certain things called mercy bookings or uh, at a more extreme, um, well, sorry, I'm kind of jumbled a little bit. I, re, I redid this whole speech, so I'm a little bit back and forth, kind of out of place. I apologize for that. Um, so these mercy bookings is people with mental health conditions are brought to jail because the police officer believes, you know, if they're living on the street, that it'll be better for them in jail. Um, and then you also have things called Baker Act. I'm not sure, has anyone here heard of Baker Acts? Okay, quite a lot of people have heard of the Baker Act. Um, this was interesting to me. In 2000, there were 80,869 cases of Baker Acts in the state of Florida, which was 34% more than people who were uh, arrested for DUI. And then, that number has gone sky high since then. And this astounded me, 40,000 children in Florida were Baker Acted in 2018 and 2019 combined. And for those who don't know what the Baker Act is, it's a person is allowed to be involuntary, uh, involuntarily hospitalized for up to 72 hours to allow for observation because someone believes that they're at risk of hurting themselves or others. So let's now get to, I, I apologize, this is way out of alignment. Let's talk about the other cases, that's where you were, talk about the other, like, more rare cases. Yes, thank you. Uh, I apologize for the people watching online, this is probably very boring. I'll try to speed this up. So once someone, uh, once someone is arrested and they are put in jail, an issue there is the lack of accommodations they'll receive. They will be, I know of cases where someone who uses uh, TTY was not allowed to use it. Someone who uses um, video conferencing was not allowed to use that. Then you also have people, you have showers that are not wheelchair accessible, so there's not a straight ramp into it. There's a step they can't get out of. Uh, Florida Department of Corrections, Miami-Dade Department of Corrections have settled lawsuits uh, for, like I said, prisoners who are not given sign language interpreters and accessible methods of communication, and sometimes they're not given medical care as well, necessary medical care. And then 
Another problem. Okay. I'm going to pause for a second and collect myself. I, I again apologize. Uh, so as I mentioned a little bit ago, institutions were kind of the holding place for people with disabilities for a long time. Jails have now become sort of the new institutions. Um, in Miami-Dade County, the number of people with mental health conditions is five times higher than any of Florida's psychiatric hospitals. And then, in a twist actually, an old psychiatric hospital has now become like a jail. As I mentioned, there is a, a group of institutions in Florida back in pre-80s called Sunland. Most of them have closed, but there are two remaining in Mariana and Chattahoochee. These places are called Pathways in the Developmental Disabilities Defendant Program. These are places for people who were charged with felonies, but the charges were dropped because they were not competent to stand trial. Both facilities are being described as secure facilities, and they don't define what that is, but they have closed circuit television, canines. Uh, that's not a institution that I think of that's a jail. Let me see what time I'm at. I have a lot of time, okay. Sorry, a few more seconds, everybody. Uh, you're taking the picture at the wrong time when I'm disorganized. Now, for people who are in that position where they, are stand, they can't stand trial because they're judged incompetent, and that's the term they use, is incompetent. I personally don't like that term, but it is what it is. Uh, people in these cases, they can be in jail, not charged with anything for a significant amount of time. You have cases where... Um, I don't condone what he did, but I'm just giving an example. The man who committed the Aurora, Colorado shooting, theater shooting back in 2012, he was held in jail for years and years and years because he was not competent to stand trial. And during his stay, they were basically pumping him with medication and things like that just so he could stand trial. And again, I don't condone what he did at all, but this is just an example of what they do to a lot of people. And people who end up at places like Mariana, Chattahoochee, those are people who are unable to be medicated enough to stand trial. So they're basically held in jail indefinitely in a place like that. And the problem is these lengths of stays are significantly longer than people who don't have disabilities. Uh, I think, here we go. One report said that the amount of time that a person will spend in jail who has a mental health condition is eight times longer than someone who doesn't have a disability. And again, most of that stay, they're not actually charged or convicted with anything. They're just kind of in a holding pattern. Once they are in jail, Aside from the lack of accommodations, they are treated horribly. They are subject to solitary confinement at a higher rate than the general population. Also abuse, sexual assault, and not just by other prisoners, by prison, prison employees, authorities. 
and the Human Rights Watch described, quote, an epidemic of unnecessary, excessive, and even malicious force in U.S. prisons and jails targeting prisoners with mental health conditions, including the use of chemical sprays and electric stun devices, the strapping of inmates to chairs and beds for days at a time, and physical violence resulting in broken jaws, noses, and ribs, as well as lacerations, second-degree burns, deep bruises, and damaged internal organs, and even death. So, wonderful spread of things that can happen to you if you have a disability. Here is some good news. There is no longer the death penalty for people who have an intellectual disability. Thank you, U.S. Supreme Court. In Florida, prior to 2001, someone with an intellectual disability could be executed. They changed that. The legislature passed a law that prohibited it. The Florida Supreme Court defined an intellectual disability with what's called a bright line test, which is kind of a hard cutoff. There's no room for, it's a black and white sort of thing. There's no gray area. The Florida Supreme Court defined it as an IQ of 70 or below was considered an intellectual disability. Here's the problem. IQ tests were not designed to determine if someone lived or died. And in fact, uh, Alfred Binet, who was creator of one of the more prominent IQ tests, the Stanford Binet, said that, quote, the IQ scale is only, a, is only a rough guide for identifying and helping learning disabled children, end quote. It's, you can't really judge an IQ based on one test. There are certain areas where they're ranked higher, some areas where they're ranked lower. It's kind of an aggregate. Thankfully, in 2002, the US Supreme Court banned the execution of people with intellectual disabilities at the national level. But the problem was, in the state of Florida, if you had an IQ of 71, you were still eligible to be killed. Thankfully, the U.S. Supreme Court took up a case in 2014 involving a man named Freddie Lee Hall, who was found guilty of murder in Florida in 1978 and was sentenced to death. He tried multiple times to abstain, obtain a stay of execution, but was always denied because his IQ was over 70. He continued appealing his case, appealing his case, and took on even more fervor once the U.S. Supreme Court ruled Okay. <laughs> Once the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that people with, intel uh, with mental conditions could not be executed, the U.S. Supreme Court found that this bright line test of 70 or lower was unconstitutional. That that's too strict. You need to take kind of the circumstances of the person before determining. So. What I've discussed today is a bit heart-wrenching, uh, a bit tough. I, I've skipped over a lot because I didn't think I would finish all of that in 30 minutes. Um, I guess I'll take some questions really quick. Uh, you had a question earlier or you're good? Gotcha. I'll go to you, and then you, and then you. Yes, ma'am. Would someone mind uh, kind of projecting for her? OK.
More or less? All right, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, that is a good question. I don't know 100% for sure, so I don't want to mislead you, but I imagine you would speak to the ADA coordinator at the court and they would be able to assist you. I don't think you would outright say that you have an intellectual disability or a mental health condition or a cognitive impairment uh, although that is something that you would speak to an attorney about and they would be able to kind of lead you down the path to make sure that you got the right accommodations. I know that's not a great... Oh, um... oh sorry. Right. Gotcha. Did Is the mic still good? Yes. Excellent. Uh, I think that's something that I might address in the in my kind of trailing solutions area, but that is a good question. I hadn't even considered that. Um, come talk to me afterward, and I'll just kind of discuss it a little bit more with you, if that's okay. I lost track of who had questions. I'll go with you, and then if you had a question earlier, I'll come back, I promise. So, so I have a question for the mind of the seven people with disabilities in jail. Because on that panel, when I tried fire department, and you know, they have adequate bedding, food, shelter, and you know, there's a, you know, there's a downside of the fire, you know, the firefighters that respond to us, and they get adequate food, shelter, and water. So why, why have this program? You know, so there's no support for the disabilities there. You know? That's an interesting point. Um, right. Uh, I mean, there's something. Sure.
I can kind of sort of, uh, sort of answer sort of a direction that everyone's kind of sort of related to that. There are people who notice that that's an issue, but they're trying to address it by reopening institutions. And I mean, just my personal opinion, I don't think that's a great idea considering the past of institutions, but I don't know, that's, that's a debate for a whole other day because that goes to a whole issue and that's not an easy question to address. Uh, there was a man in the salmon shirt in the back. Well, all courts these days are required to have something called an ADA uh, coordinator. And if you're attending for jury duty, if you're on trial for any reason, you are encouraged to contact the ADA coordinator, I think up to seven days in advance of when you're going to appear and they'll create accommodations and arrangements for you to be able to have an interpreter, uh, accessible, accessible paths, which is especially useful for a lot of old courthouses that were built in the 1900s, well before the ADA. If you're being represented in court by an attorney, that's something that I would absolutely address with them because they know the system better than the average person, so they'll know who to talk to how to assist things, if that makes any sense. Yes, sir. Perfect question for which I have a perfect answer. The answer is, to the best of my knowledge, very little. Um, actually, a couple of years ago, I was invited to speak at the Miami-Dade Public Defender's Office for that exact reason. And again, I don't know actual statistics, but if they wanted to bring me in to discuss these issues, it, it kind of gives me the idea that that's something that they don't as exactly address. They certainly don't address it in law schools, which law schools is just kind of an overview of what is a contract, what is a lawsuit, things like that. They don't really kind of dive into the weeds and rarely do they have any sort of disability courses. Um, I was fortunate that FIU, the school that I went to, had a disability history, uh, had a disability law course but that didn't really dive into any sort of these issues. It was more kind of an overview of what law and disability is. So, I mean, it's a good sign that the Miami-Dade Public Defender brought their whole crew down to listen to the speech. So that is a good, a good sign, but that's something that you would want to talk to them, say, hey, my name is such and such. I, this is a concern of mine. You know, there's, there's Miami-Dade did something like this, perhaps you would consider speaking to somebody to try and train your PDs because more often than not, someone who has a dis, on average, someone who has a disability or just in general is going to need a public defender, even initially. Uh, even if they get uh, counsel later for your first hearing, your arraignment, things like that, at the very, very beginning, you may have no one but a public defender. So if they don't know how to accommodate you, that's gonna make things a lot worse for you. 
Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And that sort of goes to a point that I neglected to mention earlier, but people with disabilities and how they relate to uh, the criminal justice system is very much underreported in the news. When I wrote this back in 2016, I, it took me weeks and weeks, months if not, to try and scrape up any sort of information about all of this. I was hoping and expecting it would just be kind of a quick and easy, okay, I can pull this, pull this, pull those, there would be a ton of information. There wasn't really back then. Good news is there's a lot more reporting of this, especially in light of the, um, oh, the Black Lives Matter movement last year. There's a lot more reporting on this, especially people of color have, as much as people with disabilities have a higher rate of police interactions, arrests, deaths, it's even higher for people of color. So, I mean, it's unfortunate that it needs to be reported, but the good news is it is being reported more. Yes, sir. Right. Unfortunately, that's a problem with public defenders in general. They, I don't remember the exact numbers, I watched something on this, they'll sometimes get hundreds of cases concurrently at the same time. Well, I was in another state at the time. Right, but it doesn't matter what state you're in. Um, so as a result, I mean, it's not ideal, but unfortunately in a lot of cases it's easier for them to just say plead guilty and get this over with. And again, I know people from law school, some of my classmates who are PDs, and I do not envy them in the slightest because it is very tough to deal with that many cases, not to mention a lot of these cases can be very severe. It's not just a, a broken taillight or whatever. So it's not easy for them, but um, that's an issue that needs to be solved, not just for people with disabilities, but just at the PD level as a whole, sorry, public defender level as a whole. Um, and hopefully if that gets sorted a little bit and that will involve extra funding, uh, more incentives for people to become a public defender because public defenders and prosecutors for that matter at the entry level are paid very little compared to other attorneys. Yes. Do we have like a, like a, um, like a slogan like for the people with disabilities? Because we are almost as high as them, not quite as high, but we don't have a thing about like disability rights matter or because they have black lives matter, but we're never given like, because as this course before, we are treated as badly as people of color. Right. The shorter answer is I don't know, but my solution to that is if you want to, start it. This is the perfect place to rally people to your support. I mean, you have a rest of this whole Saturday. Uh, everyone who's in here, I imagine, is in here not because they think people with disabilities sh should be treated poorly. So I think this is your perfect cohort to start a movement like that. Other, yes. I hope you don't mind. Um, I'd like to provide a resource for everybody here, if it's okay. 
please, please. It is. Uh, 
uh, sir and ma'am, I, I know I was taking questions, I apologize. This first part took, let me just get through my solutions really quick and then I will answer your questions. I apologize for that. So despite how much, how difficult this is, how much wrong there is with the system, the good news is there are solutions appearing. For example, in Miami-Dade, there's something called the 11th Judicial, uh, Judicial Circuit's Criminal Mental Health Project. And the first part of the system is crisis intervention team training, which teach office, law enforcement officers how to recognize how, how to recognize that they are dealing with someone with a mental illness. And they will use these tools bring the encounter to a non-violent end. And eventually, if someone is brought into court, the, can anyone hear me? Okay. Um, is to lessen the amount of time that they're in jail. If it's a minor misdemeanor or whatever, it's to hopefully within 24, 48 hours to say, essentially put them on probation, get them the help that they need. If they need to have a medication or they need other resources, that's the goal of that. And it's worked. Since it was created, Of years here it dropped. Any issues? Okay, maybe this is better. Okay. Sorry about that. Everyone can hear me? All good. Okay. Next, as a uh, man in the back mentioned, there's something called a wallet card that's run through the Disability Independence Group down in Miami. And the goal of that is it's a little bit of it. It's an ID card that says, hello, my name is such and such. I have this disability. Here are some accommodations that I'll need. And the goal is to hand that to the police, uh, to the law enforcement officer, along with your license registration. And the system is also done along with training by Disability Independence Group to make sure that officers know how to respond to that. The problem is that was only done at a very local area in Coral Gables, which is a very small community. So something like that needs to be expanded at the larger city, the state, the national level. And there is kind of a situation with that happening. There are some states that are considering uh, driver's licenses having some sort of a, an additional identification on it saying that I have autism. And the law enforcement officers will be trained to say, okay, I see this, this is what I need to do. And then as good as all that is, the most important thing is training ourselves, training our family members, our loved ones, because I was pulled over for speeding. I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I was pulled over for speeding for the first time in my life a couple of months ago. And luckily I had given a seminar a couple of years ago about how to interact with police, which is have, have both hands on the steering wheel, don't make any sudden movements, say I'm going to be reaching for my wallet, things like that. So we need to, it's unfortunate to say it, but that's necessary in order to make sure that you have a safe interaction with a law enforcement officer. That needs to be taught to anyone, regardless of age, especially someone with a disability, because once you run it through your head a few times, it becomes second nature and you won't be as nervous. 
and if there are nerves going on with the person who's being pulled over or in an interaction, that just heightens the whole situation. Again, it shouldn't be that way, but it is what it is. Also, there's something called prepaid legal. Um, it's a, uh, there are, it's not called prepaid legal, but there are organizations where you pay a fee per month and you essentially have a lawyer on standby 24 seven and they give you these cards that you hand to a law, a law enforcement officer saying, don't speak to me until I've contacted my attorney, things like that. As, it, as much as it needs to be done at the law enforcement level to train these, the officers, it also needs to be done on our end. And then lastly, police shouldn't be dealing with certain situations like this. Uh, there was a case where uh, a young girl was having uh, family issues. She was kind of lashing out a little bit, but it was a situation that could have been easily resolved with a therapist or a psychologist, but instead the police were called and she, was ended, she ended up being killed. So funding needs to go to different areas instead of just having the police being the response to all of our problems because they can only learn so much and they're, res they're trained to respond to violent crimes and other things, but these are situations that, like I said, could be easily resolved if the right personnel are there to assist. So that needs to be sort of a, another, another, another emphasis, another area that we need to focus on. Um, hold, let's see what time it is. Um, I had a question from him. Question from him. Um, also, it's almost 3.30, so, or it's almost 3.30, so if you need to go, um, thank you for coming. I apologize for kind of the, the hiccups and things like that, um, but hopefully you learned some information from this. Uh, feel free to contact me at my email, um, and I will answer any questions I have. Um, I would normally have a sign-up sheet, but because of COVID, I didn't want as much um, physical interaction with both me for anyone, just to keep everyone safe. But again, my email is andrewsagona.advocate at gmail, and it's also in the uh, flyers. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, I appreciate everyone who came. Um, and if anyone wants to stay for the remaining questions, feel free. Uh, you were first, sir.
That is a good question. Um, attorneys are sometimes able to assist with that process. Um, there are places called guardian ad litems, but I'm not sure if they focus as much on the legal side of things. But I, I don't have a, a good answer for you. I don't personally know. But um, if I find something out, I can certainly let you know if you email me. Yes. Sorry, that's not a great answer. Uh, unfortunately, some of the people had questions left, unfortunately. Um, does anyone else have a question? Honestly, don't know. Again, I, I that's not a great answer. Um, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I can ask the next question. Oh no, I got gotcha. you. No worries. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, as I, I sort of alluded to, kind of co uh, commenting, speaking to your representatives your senators, things like that, and letting them know that this is an issue that might help a little bit and to speak to people here, create a movement so that that is created because I don't know 100% if something like that does exist. Yes, sir. That's a good that's a good example of what can be done just kind of go adjacent from that parallel into something to assist people with disabilities uh, does anyone else have any other questions I guess not well I thank you all for sticking around a little bit longer than the cut time but um, again I apologize for kind of the jumpiness of it but thank you for sticking around and if you have any questions feel free to come up to me um, thank you again i hope you have a good rest of your convention